and uh, really advocating for getting the best that we can out of our performance for our adult learners. Uh, and so uh, we're real happy today. What we're doing is presenting kind of a second update on comments that are being made by the public on changes being made to the national reporting system. So uh, this is a uh, in process. Um, this summer we participated uh, and did a webinar that kind of charged the field with the initial request for comments that went out from the Department of Education. And then um, those have been sent in. The Department of Education has uh, provided some feedback uh, and now we're coming back and kind of wanting to do level set with the field and say, this is what the public has said. Uh, and this is the future direction because there's one more bite at the apple for us when it comes to uh, presenting and what we'd like to see in the national reporting system for the coming years. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Sharon uh, Bonnie at the CoWave, who's so polite and uh, wonderful to host this event and let her talk a little bit about CoWave's role in this. Yes, thank you so much, Anson. So I just want to welcome everybody. We're very excited that you're here. Um, and our goal really is that we're trying to help the field in a way to advocate for themselves. We hear so often that these testing requirements are such an issue. and They're really causing problems for the field. And we're going to hear a little bit more about that and ways that we can successfully advocate for ourselves. And this is one way. So I love this picture that Anson had actually put out originally because I feel that that is what we're talking about here is the issue of the exam taking. Um, I also would like to now go to the next slide, Anson, if you will, and talk a little bit about our presenters. As Anson had mentioned, we have some um, really esteemed colleagues here who are presenting. So I'm going to start right from the top, and I'd like to talk a little about Anson. So Anson Green is a workforce education and training trailblazer whose passion is deploying innovative service models for low and middle skilled workers to support their life ambitions. He loves challenging legacy education and training perspectives and pioneering solutions. He brings a deep and varied portfolio of accomplishments to his work. His diverse background in adult and development education and workforce development drives a vision to deliver solutions for student success. He is currently developing a workforce development and credentialing system for frontline team members at Tyson Foods. And um, I would just wanna say that prior to that, Anson worked as many of you know as a state director of adult education there in Texas, which is where I had the opportunity to meet him. He is our award-winning administrator of the year for uh, COIP's National Award Administrator of the Year Award. So thank you, Anson. And I also wanna say before I go to the next presenter, behind the scenes, Anson has truly led the charge in this for us. He's really been the team leader who's gotten us all together and put in a ton of time and love and care and thought into some of the resources we're gonna be sharing with you. So thank you, Anson, for that. We truly appreciate it. Um, next, I want to go to uh, Jen Bainick. Jen has her doctorate. She's the Director of Digital Learning and Research at EdTech Center at World Education. Her work centers on teacher professional development, technical support, and research on the topics of digital literacy, adult learning, English language learning, and online learning. As part of this work, Dr. Bainick directs the Ideal Consortium, a community of practice for state-level ABE staff who prioritize quality distance and blended learning and remote instruction. So welcome, John, thank you so much. We really appreciate all your uh, contributions to this as well. And then Lori Kirsten Joseph is acting vice president of Pima Community College's Adult Basic Education for College and Career Division. Lori is a servant leader with 21 years of experience leading and directing all aspects of adult education from student services, instruction, professional learning, curriculum development, testing and placement, IBEST and transition program, grant administration, as well as collaboration and partnership. And I also want to say that Lori is serving on our COA board in a variety of roles uh, as our regional rep, but also as our workforce development chair. And she's done a fantastic job at that. Thank you, Lori. And then finally, we have Amanda Berkson Shilcock. And for those of you who worked with Amanda, you know, uh, there's a lot about Amanda here. So she is the Director of Upskilling Policy there at the National Skills Coalition. She works on adult education and workforce policies that support US born and immigrant ad adults with foundational skills gaps. In this role, she analyzes policy, makes recommendations and coordinates with National Skills Coalition member organizations to address issues facing adult learners and job seekers, including immigrant workers. She's authored numerous publications and policy recommendations on immigrant integration, workforce development, and adult education. 
And I just want to say that Amanda is, has been an absolute uh, wonderful partner to work with. National Skills Coalition has been a real true partner with uh, the Coalition on Adult Basic Education. So thank you, Amanda, for all of your work in the field. So that is our esteemed list there. We have quite the lineup for you. And as you're probably aware, they have a lot to share. So now I'm going to turn this right over to Anson, who's going to get us started. Well, thank you very much, Sharon. Um, it's a great group. And I wanted to uh, start off by saying to uh, congratulate Lori and Pima for uh, being uh, nominated for the Bellwether Award Prize. I saw that come through on Twitter. That's uh, quite a, a great honor for the college and for what you're doing there with iBest and the ability to benefit work. So great congratulations. It's a, it's a good panel. I'm gonna be the kind of head bottle washer on the session here and walk us through the different areas, but uh, I really like that we've got uh, some great, uh, a great bench of research on this topic here as well as um, a great frontline practitioner who did a wonderful job in Arizona uh, getting the word out and, and really helping uh, inform her colleagues about what we're doing here in the public comment process. I want to say a few things about the public comment in general. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this started last summer. Um, public comment is something I'm real happy that COEB is wanting to get more involved in and helping use their platform uh, we have over 600 people on this webinar today. Um, use this platform to really help um, inform the federal and state partners out there about what is needed in adult education. Um, I used to be the state adult education director in Texas, and I remember when you get to those positions, you, you can lose sight of what's happening at the local level. And so having COAB with that great reach help inform our great uh, colleagues over there at the Department of Education who work on adult education policy. Um, that's a great team over there at Octa, and uh, they really are hungry to find out what does the field need, what do they want uh, to help tell the story of performance for adult education students uh, in a better effective way. So on the September 21st, comments were submitted by a wide variety of organizations. I'm gonna show you a website in a little bit where you can go see those comments. And, um, and, and I wanna reflect, I've read all of them. I wanna tell you, uh, the field did a great job with really perceptive comments that were submitted, well-researched, and that's what matters in a public comment process. Um, so we are, I really appreciate the effort that you put out there. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of like voting. We saw uh, how important voting was this year. Public comment is the same thing. If your voice isn't heard and if you don't say your uh, intentions in a very articulate way, sometimes you can lose sight of where you're trying to go. Um, I think the field did a great job of getting comments out there. And that's something that I'm proud to see COABE of taking up. I think in, in the future this year, I've shared with others, I think we'll see other opportunities for public comment. Um, definitely, uh, I, I think we'll see something in the world of immigration coming our way. That could be a place where everybody on this uh, phone call probably has an opinion and something that they'd like to see for their local communities. Um, and then I'm already hearing rumblings about a reauthorization of WIOA. There again would be another wonderful opportunity for COAB and the members out there to participate in the public comment process. So here we are today um, uh, on the 24th, Octay released their response to the comments that were submitted in September. Uh, and then um, those are uh, out there for us to look at and see. Uh, and now we have one more bite at the apple, as I mentioned, and we can make a, a response back to Octay. Uh, maybe uh, support what they say, maybe counter what they say with some other evidence. And those will be due uh, December 21st. So we've got this uh, kind of winter surprise here in terms of the last uh, uh, thing that we can do before we go on our break and submit, let our voice be heard and uh, submit some comments back to Octa about really what we'd like to see in the national reporting system for the next year. Um, so our objectives are, I think you're hearing why this is important. Um, this is really about how every little class, every little program, every state agency will be reporting under the national reporting system for the next uh, couple of years at, at a minimum. And uh, these opportunities don't come up all the time. And when they make a, a change, um, it does take some deliberation. So this is an important moment. If there are things in there you wish 
were uh, uh, not were in there that they're not, or some flexibilities that you think would be beneficial to telling the story of what you're doing in your local program, now's the time. Um, so we're going to get to hear from teachers, administrators, leaders, what folks have done, um, and uh, really uh, contribute to this process. Um, so let me turn over and start to talk a little bit about what the public process and what the public looked like. Um, this is a, a list of the organizations that submitted comments um, that we found on the uh, National Register here. And uh, you see a wide variety of different organizations and individuals that submitted comments down there. Um, some folks uh, participated in multiple different ways to do this, but uh, we've got companies, we've got community colleges, state agencies, state organizations, uh, research organizations, and this is what it's all about in terms of getting the word out. You can go on to the COABE website. I'm going to flip over and show you how to do that real quick. So um, if we go to the COABE website and... Uh, Click over here. So this is uh, this will be at the end of the webinar, but this is coabe.org NRS comments. You go in here and uh, you can see where coabe has uh, posted all of these. I'll zoom it up a little bit. All of the comments. Uh, you can click on these and you can go see what each individual organization said or the individuals down at the bottom here. But also vital to this web page are some of the documents that have been, been proposed. So there are the actual reporting tables that Octay published that are the tables that they're making changes to. You can clearly see what the changes they proposed are. And we'll have some screenshots of those in just a second. And then you can also go and see uh, the actual NRS descriptors and what those look like, uh, where they make some reference in their responses. Octay's recent response that was published on November 24th is published here. So you can go back and this is a document where Octe says, well, uh, five commenters mentioned that they wanted to see this happen on table four and Octe discusses what the uh, changes would be. And then Octe uh, tells what their proposed uh, changes are, whether they're gonna change something or not. And then the actual federal register notice where you can go see all of this information is, is right down here. So uh, we've got a great resource here through COABE uh, to go and check out exactly what is up for stakes when it comes to um, uh, uh, the whole process and what people are saying at this moment. A quick summary of the major comments, and we're going to go through these in greater detail, but what, what we did was went through all the comments and coded them in terms of what uh, who, who voted in on what changes, basically. Uh, and we see that we saw a, a really strong showing on two topics. One on creating more flexibility around the use of, of uh, the measurable skills gain measure. And then quite a bit of comments focused around uh, topics of distance education and digital literacy. So those two things really surfaced as major areas where the majority of people submitting comments um, uh, uh, voiced in on those two areas. Second, or uh, probably in that list was uh, another group of comments on areas of high school equivalency reporting and how that could be more made more transparent and more uh, robust. And then uh, the, the other area, I think, was some other fine points on the measurable skills gain measures. So um, we're going to go through each of these areas in more detail with the presenters. But there are a lot of other areas of concern. And I don't want people thinking that was the only story that was told in the public comments. Um, there was a wide variety of other things submitted related to uh, uh, broad areas. Um, but a lot of it pointed to, I think, just embracing the concept that the NRS tables um, really are not completely sufficient enough to tell the story of the broad scope of services that are being provided through adult education at this moment under WIOA and the flexibilities that people have seen um, through just uh, the requirements that they've had to implement and services during the pandemic. It's really changed how service delivery has happened, 
but it's also created a lot of people thinking more creatively about how to get the job done in adult ed. And that means there's other new areas that people feel like there's some broader areas of application that we could get better performance on when it comes to multiple measures of eligibility and areas like that. So when you div, di, dive in and look at the comments, you'll really get to see what people had to say. So I'm going to take the first few of these and then we're going to move over to Amanda, Lori and Jen to talk about some of the areas. But one of the big areas that people were interested in, and this is really, I think, driven out of the pandemic and the need for serving individuals, but the inability uh, in March and April to be able to test individuals on the NRS test. And that got people really thinking about the requirements around eligibility. And so um, several of the commenters proposed that um, because it's not really a requirement, it's not a requirement that an NRS test be uh, used to determine eligibility in adult education. And the Department of Education has been very clear about that. You don't have to take a test to be shown at a certain level to be eligible for adult education. That's not in the federal statute. It's not in the regulations. Um, and what that means is uh, during the pandemic, we had to do it because there were no other options, but uh, students started to, programs started to find multiple different ways to find and determine eligibility. And so looking into the future, um, there were quite a few comments that said, you know, the tables drive us into providing tests for the students. And here's an example of what this might look like. But we, we report on these levels, the tests make us get students to these levels by testing them. But what if we have students that come in that say, for example, only need a high school equivalency and uh, they don't really need to take a tape test. They could take a pretest for a high school equivalency, equivalency exam and that could be determining their eligibility. How could they report something like that? Well, they couldn't. They'd still have to give them a TABE or a CASAS test, for example. So uh, it got people thinking, why do we do this? Why do, why do we give them a TAPE test and then we give them a GED prep test or a high set prep test when we really only need to be giving one of those tests? And why couldn't we create some flexibility in the tables? So that was one group of comments that came in. I love the idea because there's a lot of students that come in that we can determine eligibility in many different ways beyond giving them a test. Uh, it cuts down on costs related to pre-testing and, and all of the other mechanics that go into having to pre-test every student um, as they enter services. So this was one way of really uh, folks were getting creative and thinking about how can we open up that eligibility determination, uh, use what we've learned during the pandemic and get more creative and still be able to report folks on the tables by putting them in what uh, one group labeled the non-level layer uh, level Others called it uh, the other assessment level, um, but I really like that flexibility. So that was one group of comments and you can go back and read those in more detail. Um, this was the biggest area. Um, I think uh, almost 80% of the comments were focused around creating more flexibility related to the measurable skills gain types. And so what I mean by that is, is when you um, look at the measurable skills gain that we owe, and I put this table up here to help inform everybody so we don't lose you in, with the jargon, but there are basically five different types of measurable skills gains that are published and um, cr created through regulation um, out of WIOA. And these are implemented by the workforce programs, by the vocational rehab programs and by the adult ed programs. Um, in adult education, we're very familiar with what we call the type one, which is your pre-post testing, um, and the type two, the high school equivalency testing. So these are the two that, you know, 90 plus percentage of all students in America on the NRS are getting uh, their performance through. And then we had these other three types. Uh, these are more workforce and employment related measures. And what, um, and, and so when we look at these measures, um, a lot of the, uh, almost 80% of the respondents said, there are these other measures that we currently aren't using in great uh, regard. They're using it all in adult education, the type three, the type four, the type five. These are transcripts and report cards, progress reports on employment milestones, and passage of certain exams on 
uh, uh, credentialing exams. Those are things that a, a lot of individuals in adult education are earning, but there's no way to report them. And so that's the broad area we saw a lot of people wanting flexibility. And this is the area that actually is out for a comment from the Department of Ed on the tables. This is table four. And what Octay was seeking information on was saying, we'd like to open up this broader group of, of eligibility, of, of uh, measurable skills gains, broaden that up for the integrated education and training program um, only. And so that was what they were asking the public to weigh in on. What the public said was, we think this is a really good idea. I don't, there were no comments against the idea of opening these five MSGs up for the IET programs, but there was 80% uh, uh, of the comments were saying, why don't we either open up all those MSGs, one, two, three, four, five, for all participants, or another subset was saying, why don't we open them up for participants in workforce preparation activities, workplace literacy, or the IELCE program. So these were folks that were saying, you know, we do credentials in uh, workplace literacy programs with employers. I work at Tyson Foods. Our students that are in our adult education programs are taking employment-based tests all the time and they want to learn to read better or learn to do math better or learn to speak English better so they can pass those tests for their jobs. There's no way we can report that right now because it's a workplace literacy class. It's not an IET. Um, workforce preparation activities, which Amanda's going to talk about in a second here, that's your digital literacy and a lot of your other workforce oriented prep skills. Um, there's no way to report that. We're doing tens of thousands of thousands of digital literacy um, uh, preparation classes right now in America, and that activity is not getting reported. And so a lot of the folks were saying, let's open up the MSGs for that. Uh, IELCE, another one where we're preparing our immigrant workforce for jobs and uh, workplace skills um, and have a limited amount of uh, I, uh, MS, MSGs that we can use to report those individuals. So this was a big area, 80 plus percentage of the folks that were submitted comments were wanting changes in these areas and definitely we can see why. Um, when you see what people's arguments were, they looked at like the definition in statute of workplace literacy and said, look, it says that the goal of workplace literacy is to improve the productivity of the workforce, not make a gain on a TAVE test, not make a gain on a CASAS test, but a productivity measure. And when you look at these MSGs four and five, these are really measures of worker productivity, milestones at work, apprenticeship milestones and milestones in training, uh, credentialing milestones not necessarily in an IET, although they could be, but in workplace literacy programs in general. So that's examples of the kind of evidence people were putting out there to make the case for MSGs uh, uh, being expanded for different types of programs. We applaud what the Department of Education wants to do with IET. That is a fundamental great move that I think everybody's applauding, but we really think there's some growth there that we can actually bring this into some of these other types of activities that are allowable under adult education. And there's great report and great uh, evidence in the statute and the regulations to do that. The next one too, uh, I'll continue on, has to do with exit. Um, those of you that use the measure, uh, individuals that are in adult education, and they enter post-secondary education uh, can get a gain if the individual exits. And so uh, a group of, of commenters were like, this exit thing causes challenges for us. Why could not we get the credit if an individual transitions from adult ed uh, and is continuing to get adult education, maybe in lieu of developmental education, but they enter college. That should be counted as a gain. Um, and so there were folks that said, here's the measure. States may report an EFL gain for participants who exit the program and enroll in post-secondary education or training during the program year. Why don't we get rid of this exit? Because it creates all kinds of 
uh, uh, perverse behaviors on the adult education side in terms of folks worried about, are they gonna gain? Is the individual going to exit in time for them to get the performance measure? And I wanna show you some examples of what that looks like. So here's how the measure works. A student's in a period of participation. Uh, before the end of the program year on June 30th, they exit and they need to enter post-secondary education and training before the end of the program year. So you can see that calculation of the exit. So this is how the, the measure works. But you have to have that exit um, and you have to be in post-secondary education before the end of the program year. So the next example is really where people, um, uh, a good example of why this causes challenges. There's a lot of students that are in high school preparation programs. They're high school equivalency preparation programs. And they wanna go into an IET. And everybody on this call, I think would applaud that as a, a logical and uh, natural progression for many, many students. But if that individual doesn't exit services and they don't exit here because they're still in an IET, they're still an adult ed. There's no credit for that individual through this uh, entered post-secondary education and training measurable skills game. So the exit creates, in this example, uh, a very difficult situation. Uh, it means that the individual high school preparation class is either gonna have to earn a high school equivalency or they're gonna have to take a Tabor CASAS post-test and probably take a test when they enter the IET program for the college. So there's all this extra testing that has to happen that's really not needed. Uh, and the accomplishment of the individual transitioning into an IET, maybe they're in an, an ability to benefit program and still working on that high school equivalency. It's a lost performance area uh, because of that exit requirement. So several folks were very eloquent in their uh, uh, comments about how that exit element ought to be removed. So those are the two examples I was going to focus on. And now I'm going to turn it over to Amanda, who's going to talk about uh, the importance of digital literacy. Amanda, as many of y'all know, uh, is uh, really a national leader on the topic of research around digital literacy. So Amanda, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Anson. I want to thank you for the absolute yeoman's work you've been doing on these issues uh, for the past six months. And I want to thank Sharon and co for their leadership of the field. Um, you know, this is a powerful opportunity for the practitioner wisdom that all of you have to be heard at the federal level. And when it comes to digital literacy and adult education, federal policy is lagging behind reality. Let me say that again. Federal policy is lagging behind reality. And that's not out of any malice or any um, bad intent at the federal level. There's a lot of terribly smart, hardworking, committed folks in federal agencies and in the Congress. The challenge is that we're working out of a system that was not set up for the labor market that we see today and certainly not for, for a COVID reality, right? So certainly since the pandemic hit and even before that, you as practitioners know that digital literacy is a component of what you've been helping adult learners to acquire, either as foundational digital skills, as they are getting kind of baseline comfort level with not just using a smartphone, but actually using a mouse, using a tablet computer, things like that. Um, but also in many cases, some of you are, are teaching digital literacy in the context of technical skills training as part of integrated education and training programs, right? Maybe you're doing a program for home health aides and you're helping them learn to use the app they're gonna need to do to report their hours to get paid. Maybe you're teaching mechatronics and you're helping folks who are gonna be going into those jobs learn how to use the kind of entry-level software they might have to use. Maybe you're doing retail training and you're helping retail workers learn how to use a price change app or an inventory control app. Right? Maybe your learners are bringing in things that we in the field usually call realia, right? Examples of a real life um, a piece of, of material that they've encountered, right? It used to be a bus schedule or something like that. Now it might be a photo with their smartphone of the cash register they have to use at work and how elaborate it is now that they have a point of sale device, right? So you're doing all this work and we're not getting credit for it. 
And that is so frustrating, right? We want the federal system to recognize the investment that adult education is making in preparing adult learners with digital skills, both for their future as workers and their present as workers, but also for their roles as parents, as citizens, right? We've seen under COVID that parents with K-12 children at home need to be supporting their digital skill acquiring, parents who are trying to do telehealth appointments to maintain their health and well-being need digital skills, parents who are unemployed trying to find a job need digital skills, the list goes on and on, right? But at the moment, digital literacy is buried pretty deeply within the WIOA statute but it's very clearly called out as a Title II allowable activity, right? We are the folks that Congress has said should be there to help provide digital literacy. And we're doing it and we're not getting credit for it, right? And so one thing that we, you know, sort of see in the, in the comments that were submitted to Octay around this NRS was, you know, a chorus from the field of folks saying, look, there ought to be uh, easier and clearer ways for folks to be able to count digital literacy skills as a measurable skills gain. It's real, it should be counted, we should get credit for it. And you know, we haven't yet seen the progress from Octay that we'd like to see in letting that happen. So we need your voice. We need you to submit a comment by December 21st that reiterates how important this is and why it's important. And I, I encourage you to not let the perfect be the enemy of the good here, right? You don't have to craft the world's most elegant prose. You can craft two paragraphs that say, here's who I am, this is my organization, this is a learner, imaginary case, that I work with, and this is why counting digital literacy as a measurable skill gain matters for our field, right? It matters because Congress is extremely aware of the importance of, of digital literacy skills. And if we want to get more funding for adult education, we have to help Congress connect the dots about why the, um, the, the role of adult education is so important in helping people build those skills. Now, you might be thinking, well, Octay already said no on some of this. What's the point in asking them again? There's two points. One, every comment you submit is part of the administrative record. That means it's something that civil servants within the federal government can go back and refer to in the future as they develop additional guidance and proposals and rulemaking for the field. And secondly, it's something that we can point to when we talk to legislators, right? So for organizations like mine that are regularly engaged in federal advocacy or like COABE, um, we will be bringing to Congress as we know a reauthorization gets underway next year, here is what we hear bubbling up from the field, right? This is what folks are telling us needs to be changed, right? So I'm gonna pause here because there's so much other wonderful information that my colleagues are gonna share. Um, Dr. Vanek, I know has a, a lot of really useful uh, detail to share with you and I wanna make sure she has enough time to do that. But I just wanna emphasize, we need your voice. It can be short and sweet. You don't have to write the most elegant comment ever. Just get a comment in there so that your voice and your learners' voices can be heard. Hey, thanks, Amanda, and thanks, Anson, and thanks yeah. Anson for being here. Yeah, I was, let me say a word there. Uh, uh, just a transition there. Uh, I, I want to underscore something Amanda said. You know, when I was state director in Texas, the thing that just uh, really frustrated me was the amount of individuals and you and we've heard it of course during the during the onset of the pandemic was this idea that doing digital literacy was something they had to do under the table that it's like well uh how do i report this how do i make this class like uh we're doing this and i'm like oh my god of course you're doing this you know but uh it was because they felt like it threatened their uh, ability to get performance and to earn performance, that it was a distracting element. And as Amanda underscored so eloquently, it's critical to what we're doing. It's critical to what Congress intended adult ed to do. 
Um, and it's a way that we can bolster our reputation to really be more better, posi better positioned for funding and things like that, because we are providing such an elementary service. So let me turn it over to Jen um, and, and really talk about the distance education reporting elements of things. Jen, take it away. Great, thank you. Hello. So by way of introduction, I'll just say that the core of my work is supporting state level leaders and practitioners in, in sorting out how to implement scalable and um, equitable um, distance and education and blended learning programs. Um, I do that through my work with the Ideal Consortium. And so I'm gonna be focusing narrowly for a few minutes on uh, comments surrounding tables 4C and 5A, which cover reporting for learners in distance education. And just to give you um, a, a, a just a little bit of a uh, illustration of, of my process here. I, I read through all of the posted comments, uh, paying attention to the anything about distance education. I read through ACTA responses and I reflected on the space between what was posted in the comments from the field and the ACTA response. And I would like to say that I, I was pleased to see that, that the ACTA response was very much aligned to, like it was very clear that they had read all the comments and took them into careful consideration and, and, and uh, tried to respond in some way. Um, but based on um, my close work with ideal consortium uh, leaders and with others in the field, it's very clear that there is room for policy shifts within reporting and distance education that would more what that would better serve the field. So um, before I wanna jump into this, I just wanna note that these tables were relevant for a much earlier time. As, as Amanda noted, um, it, it takes a while for policy to catch up with current practice. And so when access to technologies was not as widespread and when distance education program and remote instruction were not essential for staying connected with learners, Thinking about what happens with learning according to where the learning is happening versus, you know, like in class or distance ed made a little bit more sense. But today, in a time when there is such demand on getting adult basic skills learners up to speed with being able to learn online so that they can perform using technologies at work and in, in training programs at work in post secondary education, we really cannot stick with this geographically based mindset. So um, I've divided these suggestions from the field into three different themes as from based on what I saw um, in the comments. And so I'll, 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 I'll just give you a, a summary of what these three themes are, the Octay response, and then subject some suggestions for you to actually write in your rebuttal to the Octay response. So the first one was a suggestion that table, four be, table 4C be updated to include the full comp, uh, complement of WIOA uh, measurable skill gain types that um, could be, that, that, that were also called for being evident on table four. And in the next slide, actually what you can see here is that Octay did include, um, they, they did amend table 4C to include the, um, a num the, the number of IET measurable still gains shown on table four. So again, they, they didn't, it's, it's the same thing that Anson was talking about earlier, where we really need all the full range of, measure, of measurable skill gains available to, to be um, reported on for learners, no matter the modality of instruction and no matter where they're doing their learning. So that's, that's the rebuttal to that comment. If you're going to respond, um, I, this is some suggested language you might use to do that. Uh, the second area where we saw um, comments was people, people were requesting that Octay remove table 4C and 5A. The field, it was clear from the comments, sees these tables as many people see these tables as no longer relevant. Um, table 4C began as a, a way to gauge and evaluate learner outcomes for students whose distance learning hours were more than what they were doing in, in class. However, today our systems around the country have implemented both distance and blended learning very fluidly to provide flexible access for students. And as states more fully integrate distance ed, um, it makes even more sense to consider not even addressing this table. Um, essentially, you can, you can see the Octay result uh, uh, text from the actual um, 
PDF that Anson chatted the link for. But essentially what they're saying in, in this response is that they're not getting rid of these tables and they, they don't believe there needs to be a stronger federal definition. Currently the definition that's available is fairly broad. It's reported in the NRS guidelines. And states, to be fair, are, are, are interpreting this definition in a way that aligns with what they need to put in their state policy. So these tables result in people logging data that, that aren't aligned across the different states. And so we really don't have a good picture of the efficacy of programs across state lines. Um, Octe says that Table 4C is critical for evaluation and should be used to guide efforts. But what I suggest, as you, you see on the next slide, is that you know this the, the Octe proposals don't or response doesn't necessarily acknowledge the limitations of the policy to actually paint a picture of a pro of program effectiveness because of this lack of consistency in data collection methods and definitions that at best create a fairly muddied picture of what distance education is actually, what that actually looks like in different states. And it doesn't really show us how effective it is because we don't know what states are actually doing by looking at these tables. So um, a rebuttal comments in this area could include things that you see on, on the slide here. NRS definition is very broad and is interpreted in many different ways, so it's hard to account for what's happening. Um, the Octe response suggests that we can adequately discern effectiveness, but for reasons I just suggested, there is no nod to the baked-in limitations uh, that, are, that are inherent in, in the definition and in the tables. And that really the problem is that this maintains a status quo of states investing time in implementing data practices for national reporting that don't do much to inform their work at the state level or at the program level. And in some cases, this leads to a focus on conversation around local policy about what they can count on these tables rather than on creating distance education opportunities that are based on best practice and evidence around fluid use of technologies to support learning. Um, and then finally, um, we know that other education sectors are trying to find shared understandings at the post-secondary level, especially. So, you know, uh, with Octay saying, you know, we're going to leave this to the states, we're going to keep these things broadly defined, it really kind of um, puts tosses a ball to to the state and program local program levels that in other areas of education we're, we are actually seeking for strong federal policy and 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 the work is being done and then uh, so another suggestion and the third area of, of work here is um, a suggestion across multiple comments about just modifying like keeping them but modifying them um, and the, the field said in this area that the data captured in, in, the, in the breakout tables, 4C and 5A, are really no longer meaningful um, because people are considering the definition of distance learning differently and because all, the only requirement in these tables is that anybody who's got 50% or more of their time spent learning online um, is counted here. But for reasons I just suggested, this, this is really not illuminating data when, when looked at the aggregate and even for each individual state, and that we need to be able to have a system that collects data and evaluates student engagement through the multiple types of engagement. So for example, distance learning that's exclusively distance learning or different blends of in-person and online learning at different percentages. Um, some of the comments that were, were posted actually provided uh, breakdowns of different percentages that Octave might, might explore uh, covering. So for example, in many states, um, at the state reporting level, they might require programs to report like from zero to 20% um, in person or online, and then graduate up in, in des deciles of, um, of uh, percentages, just so we, they really have a clear understanding of the types of modalities and the blends of modalities that are aligned to learner gain. So our rebuttal is that the current table is seen as misaligned to the most innovative instructional practices and is therefore underutilized. In fact, there are states that prior to the pandemic just didn't touch them. <laughs> Big states decided to not do it. Really innovative states like Rhode Island just didn't even touch these tables um, be, because they didn't tell them anything and it was 
too much of an effort for um, programs to to account for the 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 distance education um, participation in a way aligned in these tables. So what I guess what I want to leave you with and another opportunity for you to consider what you might write in a comment is that this is a moment to really rethink policy shaping distance and edu education and access because of the time that we're in. Um, on the next slide, you can see some other ideas you might include that we, you know, we do believe that it's meaningful for states and programs to participate in a federal reporting, but it has to help show how technology is enhancing learning. And, and right now that is not the case with these tables. The tables fall far short of this goal. And this is also not something we can just figure out how to do like in a minute. I really liked Amanda's actually, if you read, if you go to the, the COEB site and you check out some of the com comments, Amanda Burks and Chilcox um, com post from the National Skills Coalition is really meaningful where you know, Amanda, you wrote that, that um, your organization is, is ready to engage in a thoughtful conversation about how we can kind of blow up this, this accounting for distance education and really make it something that's meaningful for helping programs improve their, their equitable and scalable access to distance education for all students. So we need a thoughtful conversation at the national level to rethink this current distance ed policy. And now is the time because so many programs are grappling with how to use data to, to evaluate the distance education, remote learning and blended programming that they've been able to manage during the pandemic. Oh, you're muted, Anson. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. I appreciate the thoughtful comments and the suggested language. Uh, this is an area I think that's not going to go away for us in terms of innovation. Um, and uh, if, uh, as she mentioned, go back and look at the comments. You can really see some insightful ideas as well as um, critiques on why these tables um, uh, that worked 15 years ago really are no longer uh, accurately capturing what's happening in distance education across the states. So I'm gonna turn it over to our friends out there in Arizona and uh, Lori, and she's gonna talk a little bit about uh, the areas of high school equivalency reporting that the commenters uh, suggested would uh, boost uh, telling the story on high school equivalency in the states. Thanks, Anson. Um, thanks for um, having me here to talk about this today. It's an honor to be here with these great minds on this webinar. And um, and it, and this is just a really important topic, um, using our voice in this way in the field to help um, raise awareness about how these tables can be improved to really um, support, better support our work. Um, I'm glad that this is the topic I'm sharing about. It's one I'm personally really passionate about, but there were lots of folks who were um, who, who spoke up, um, several of the comments spoke up about something related to how the high school equivalency reporting could be improved. Um, the, there were sort of two themes. The first was um, around that expansion of um, possibilities for measurable skills gain and the idea that the HSC subtest, subtests, whether um, GED or high set or task, that those subtests could be, I mean, that they are valid measures of skills and that they could be used as evidence of a measurable skills gain. One of the commenters said that, that these um, HSE tests are arguably more rigorous and objective than other NRS approved, approved tests um, that are offered in, in much less controlled environments. And so this was one theme that, that was through several comments. Octay's response was, um, sort of to just point back to table four and say table four is there to report the MSGs that count towards state attendance, state performance. Um, and, and this just isn't one of the five types of MSG that's in the joint regulations. Um, so they really were sort of pointing back to the original thought around table four. And I think our rebuttal really can just be around, this is a missed opportunity. It's a missed opportunity to capture um, program and student performance in, and impact on students. Um, that is um, that that is not being captured otherwise, and this is especially important for those higher-level learners who may not be keeping up with 
you know, a tape test because they're so focused on getting that HSC. Um, so really, I think the, the response is really just the missed opportunity and not capturing this progress along the way. And then the second one is my is a personal favorite and also was quite popular with other commenters. And that is that table four does not, there actually isn't a table in the NRS reporting system that captures all high school equivalencies. As you all know, um, table four will only show those um, who achieved HSC as their last MSG, um, which means if they've uh, if they've gotten some other skill gain or or some other MSG, it won't show up. Um, uh, Octay's response to this request um, was actually to agree that there is a clear and standing need to collect and report this data that they themselves frequently get requests for this data. Um, but what they did was then pointed us to another um, report that states compile that does collect all of the HSC data. I, I think it's outside of the NRS system called the Joint Measurable Skills Gains Table in the Statewide Performance Chart. And so they pointed to this other chart instead of the NRS tables. And, and um, you know, I think, I think although there is this other table perhaps that captures it, I think the challenge is that Table four is so dominant in how we talk about how we're doing what we're doing at the program and state level that to not resolve this issue on table four actually leads can lead to confusion and even seem a bit misleading sometimes with um, external stakeholders, right? I don't know if any of you have ever tried to explain to um, a workforce partner or an elected official, well, I know that it only says this many HSCs, but it's because there's all this going on behind and it starts to feel a little slippery instead of factual. Um, so I think it's really a missed opportunity um, in a way we're failing to meet the needs of our stakeholders if we don't clarify things better on these NRS tables. Um, so I think those are our, our counter arguments there. And I hope, um, I'll tell you that I feel like talking about this, thanks Anson for continuing on because I, I, this is my transition. And that is that for, for talking with my colleagues and my and others in the state of Arizona, not you know breaking it down to issues like being able to report all HSCs really tends to get people kind of fired up. Like, wait, you're right. We should use our voice and say we need to fix some of these tables. And so I just want to um, encourage everybody to who's listening in and maybe getting fired up about about digital literacy or distance learning or or HSCs or or some of the other topics that you'll see in the public comment to really um, seriously, as Amanda said, think about putting your thoughts on paper and submitting a comment. Um, the next slide has the reminder that, de that December 21st is the deadline. Um, this is the link here to submit comments, but if you just go to coabe.org slash NRS comments, the link is also there, so you don't have to copy all that gobbledygook. Um, that's in the end of that link. So go to that that site. Um, as you as noted before, you can see what other people's comments have been before. Um, you can you can um, click through to where you can submit the comments there. I just want to note that um, you saw early on in the slides that there were individuals, there were programs, there were state associations, there were employers um, who all submitted comments. Um, I was really fired up about this and I got a lot of folks from Arizona to submit comments. You'll see everything from individuals to our state association to our program and, and frankly even our workforce development board. So I just I just want to say, you know, we really mean you. I've never done this before this, you know. I'm not an Anson Green. I haven't been writing um, about policy stuff for a long time, but but I'm a program director and, and I serve on my national and state boards and I, and I have thoughts about what would improve reporting and I'm sure you do too. So I just wanna encourage all of you to, to take a few minutes and, and put your thoughts forward on this. Great, thank you so much. Great uh, comments from Lori. And you know that you know she says I'm not an Anson Green. Well, Anson Green was a teacher, and Anson Green was running a local program, and that's that's where the good ideas come from. You know, um, uh, every time I think about any good idea I ever had, I, it's usually 15 years old, and it was something that I always wanted to get done, and, and now I'm in a different position to do those kind of things. But you're so right in, in folks getting out there. Uh, and I was really uh, empowered by uh, seeing the comments come from uh, uh, small little programs, individuals, 
taking a, a few minutes out of their time. You don't have to put anything on letterhead. You can just type it right into the comments and submit it. And many people did that. Um, so I want to thank, we got some questions here and I'd I encourage my uh, colleagues here to look at the questions too. I'm going to go through some of them, but I, I want to thank Jen and Amanda and Lori and, and Sharon for giving us this opportunity. And for, I really want to thank everybody that signed up today. Uh, it's such a busy time with uh, testing and with uh, se semesters ending and things like that for you to get onto a, a policy webinar like this. Um, so uh, one of the questions was, uh, will you send these slides to participants? There's useful info in here I'd love to tap into later. Uh, yes, we will turn around the slide deck uh, and we'll, what we'll do is uh, post this on that CoAve website um, after the webinar here and uh, be able to provide uh, everybody that feedback. Um, there's another comment here related to the timeline for the changes. So these changes that are occurring, uh, there are questions on the timeline. So there's there's two comments related to that that I'll make. One, um, that was an area that uh, people submitted comments on back in September. Uh, because the tables, um, the changes that are proposed for the IET expansion of MSGs uh, are retroactive to this year. They'll, they'll be able to report those tables this year. Um, it doesn't mean you have to because uh, they're optional, but uh, uh, Octa responded to that and you can read their comments related to that. Um, as far as these other ideas, um, the story isn't done with this yet, and I would imagine that if uh, Octa uh, changes some of their uh, uh, initial comments uh, or modifies some of their responses, that those changes most likely um, will occur in the next program year, but some of them could be retroactive to this year, um, depending on what the change is. So it's really dependent on what kind of changes are being made to the tables and whether uh, uh, Octa uh, ascertains whether that would be a burden on the states to collect that um, or if it would put states at a disadvantage performance wise to make uh, a change that would be retroactive. Some states um, had already modified their tables. I know Texas had where I'm from. So we could report all these other MSGs uh, immediately and we collect that information in Texas, uh, but other states haven't done that yet. So um, it is dependent on what the uh, of what the change is, and that typically determines uh, Octa's designation of when they'll make it implement uh, the Im implementation date. Um, there's another idea about submitting a template. Uh, they really liked Amanda's idea of submitting a comment, you know, and, and we all embrace that concept. Um, we are going to be posting and we'll bring notice to everybody that's on this webinar through your email, but we will be posting some template language, some of the arguments that you're seeing today and hearing today um, so that you can more quickly articulate um, what you would like to say in your own comments that are submitted. Um, that does help out because uh, not everybody's got the time to go research the citations and the regulations or in the law and things like that. Um, plus, it's really a great way just to inform yourself. I've learned so much over the last few months just from my colleagues. Um, and that's the one area I would uh, really encourage everybody. When you go back and look at the comments that were submitted, um, you still see areas where um, the field needs training. And so if you're a training organization out there or a state director, um, go back and look at the comments because you get a good peek under the hood on where there's either some misconceptions or an areas where people still don't feel confident. Uh, periods of participation is one that always comes up. Um, it's a difficult concept. I trained hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people in Texas on that, honestly, uh, and I never felt like I got done. So um, it, it is a good moment for us to kind of look at this kind of information because at the end of the day, this is how we tell our story. And if our local providers and, and programs don't quite understand the, the, the story that's being told, um, we're at a real disadvantage. Um, there's a question here um, from Eddie. I don't know if anybody has seen that on the call. Uh, any comment related to that question um, related to software developers and tests? Anybody got a, a feedback on that? It's a, it's a nice idea. Uh, Eddie had commented, I'll read it. Uh, have, have we considered to ask software developers to perform an initial test to determine level and prescribe from there the aligned levels with the six NRS levels? 
Um, I think some of our software programs, of course, place individuals into the software. Um, I don't know to what extent those are well calibrated to the NRS levels, um, but that is a, a great piece of feedback. Um, and let's see here. Yes, so, so uh, one of the questions, when will a decision be made about MSG and IET? Uh, that's one of the questions that was submitted. And if you look at uh, Octay's responses, um, they will make that uh, applicable to this program year um, for programs, because as I mentioned earlier, some states were already prepared to report that information, but this was a concern that other states had because their software programs weren't up to date to collect those MSGs. Um, we're at time here, and um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Sharon, perhaps, or maybe just close this thing out. Sharon, did you wanna say a last word? I do, I just wanna say thank you to everybody for taking time to attend. We really appreciate it. We have a short poll for you to take that helps us. Uh, we capture information on all of these sessions. So if you just take a minute there. And also just to mention that again, we put into the chat box, the uh, website that we would love for all of you to go to as Anson mentioned, we will have a template up for you very shortly on there as well. And just reiterating the deadline is the 21st for your, for your rebuttal. We all need to come together as a field so that we can really let Octane know that we really appreciate them, but there's a few changes we'd love to see. So I just want to thank you all. And I want to see Jen or Lori, do you have anything you'd like to say before we, we head off? No? Just okay. Thanks to Anson and Sharon for the leader, your leadership on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you on the next.